Luke chapter 22 this morning. I'm going to read it to you from uh, our text this morning, or our uh, uh, verses surrounding that, but we read a passage beginning in verse 24 through verse 34 of Luke 22, and then uh, I want to preach to you on a subject this morning I pray that will uh, help us. And uh, beginning in verse 24, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. Ye, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. But I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with one with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. I want to preach to you this morning, uh, more or less out of verse 31, where the Lord said unto Peter, and he called him Simon, mentions his name twice. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as weed. I want to preach to you on the strategy of the adversary. Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask him to bless his word. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for the day, thankful for what you've given to us, a time that we can come and gather and fellowship, and Father, uh, that we can sing praises unto you. And, O oh Lord, that those uh, hymns that we sing, may they uh, truly penetrate our hearts, that we might uh, have that attitude and uh, desire to be nearer to you. And, Father, Lord, we just ask that you might Bless the preaching of your word now. I pray for your help. I ask that you might fill me with the power of your spirit, that you'll help me to preach those things you've laid upon my heart. Father, may it encourage and uplift each and every one that's here. May it meet the need in their heart. Father, we pray for the class in the back, that again, your word will have a free course and that uh, the young folks can learn more about you this day. Father, again, we just give you all the praise for it and we ask for your help now. And we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, when you think about uh, things of strategy, I guess when I was uh, uh, pondering upon some of this, the Lord sort of uh, impressed. And I, I guess as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, something that maybe everybody can sort of understand by the way, you know, we've all probably at some time played some uh, card games, maybe board games. And uh, some of those had strategies involved. Some of them, you know, they're a little more by chance, I guess, uh, uh, depending on maybe who you play with, how uh, extreme they are, you know, there's some of those people, they just so hate to lose. I mean, they're, they're playing Candyland with a little kid and they just get upset about it. They'll flip the board over if they lose. They're just all upset. You know, they're not even, you know, they, they want to be, it doesn't matter. It's like, we'll teach them a lesson. And uh, just, uh, you've got those folks out there. And then, uh, you know, some of those games, uh, they, uh, they're sort of by luck, we might say. Don't always like the word luck. Chance might be a little better. The roll of the dice depends on how you're going to uh, play. Maybe the draw of a card determines that. Uh, we've all probably played some of those uh, great games. And, uh, you know, there's others that uh, they can't really be played without a strategy. We might say, well, uh, my strategy is to win. I want to do that. Uh, but you've almost got to have some kind of plan, some kind of something that you want to uh, take over, you want to do. Uh, I always enjoyed it one time, I guess if you didn't have nothing else to do with five or six hours of your life, that uh, you could play the game Risk. It was based on dice rolling and things. We played on New Year's a lot uh, with some friends, and uh, you conquer the world, but it takes forever. And uh, if you're still in the game at that time, and you always enjoy sort of those things. I mean, there's fun and fellowship in that. But again, sometimes the player's desire to win could also determine how much or what strategy is used. You know, I, I thought of some of our childhood games, and and all, and they're all still played now. Uh, I haven't played a lot of them in forever, uh, but but Uno, uh, you know, uh, you can be as mean as you want in that game, I guess. But it all depends on the cards you get. It's sort of like I said, a game of drawing, a game of chance, maybe as to what you get, how you do, how well you score. 
You know, there's the classic game Monopoly, the financial game. And uh, and some people, again, they play that. You might as well say they pull out a banker's hat and put it on. They just get ruthless. And, uh, you know, they just want to they just want to take people over. Me and my one sister used to play when it snowed. Uh, it seemed like in school, we matter of fact, we manufactured uh, uh, our own money because we ran out of their money. And I was usually so much in debt to her that uh, I didn't uh, didn't seem like I did very well. Uh, but we, we would play sometimes and just keep playing for a long time, not really accomplishing thing. Uh, but, but again, some people play Monopoly like that. They play very, uh, very dedicated. But again, you've got a roll of the dice. Uh, you've got cards and things that determine that. So not everything is maybe determined by strategy. Uh, the game of chess, uh, that one's a little more involved. Uh, I learned uh, how to play, uh, sort of read some books and things and uh, sort of learn from the moves. And then you play with some other people. You begin to learn a little bit of that. I can uh, probably still play a little bit. I had a friend who was actually quite good at it, uh, played on a, uh, some of the school teams. And, of course, uh, uh, around here we're, we're very noted for those things. Uh, he had played on that. And I beat him one time, got lucky. And uh, that's exactly what it was. He made a mistake. And uh, beat him with a back row checkmate. He he's probably still hasn't forgot it uh, because it's one of those things. He probably sits there. He, he sat back and he just looked at the board for a while. And uh, I could play well enough to give him a challenge, but uh, he's one of those. He talked about this and that. My strategy was just sort of well, I'm just going to win. I'm going to do this, but I could at least think through. And like I said, I could usually give him a good game. But uh, those chess players, they play different parts of the game. There's middle games and end games, and uh, they can do all kinds of things, and they really think it through. But it is one of those games you almost can't ha haphazardly play. You have to move the pieces. You have to have a strategy. You have to have something, or you're not in the game very long. So you get the idea maybe that with those kind of things, but we develop a strategy, we might say. And we use that word for a number of things. Well, I want to speak to you and preach to you today and just thought of some lighthearted examples because, again, we get that idea of having a strategy, doing something, and accomplishing that. Our text defines that the Lord says unto Peter that Satan had a strategy for him. And the strategy against Peter, as I think it is with many believers, is that it says Satan, who is the adversary. And again, think of some of the names that he's given in Scripture. Here he is called by that proper name Satan, but He's called the adversary in other places. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And again, he presents believers much like he did Job and accuses them before God and brings up those things. And well, look at this one that uh, you sacrificed uh, your son's life for. Look at what he does. I mean, I can imagine what's said about me by the accuser of the brethren. Uh, you know, someday uh, those things are going to be dealt with and put away. But Satan has a strategy. And here the Lord says, and he's speaking, this is uh, uh, before his uh, arrest and uh, during that time of the Last Supper, uh, Judas is preparing. Matter of fact, he's announced that there will be uh, one who would betray him. And then they had started talking, but the disciples, as many people gather together when they play, who's going to be the greatest among us? They had one of those type of discussions. And who's going to sit there? You know, what will we do? And the Lord did tell them. He uh, defined greatness. As a matter of fact, he brought it back. The greatest is going to have the attitude of a servant like I've showed you and uh, like I demonstrated unto you. He did tell the disciples that again, someday in the kingdom, they will have thrones and they will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. We know that they have a place there and that uh, they have a future doing some of those things. But again, they came back and they wanted to know who was going to be the greatest here. I like to think that after the crucifixion and the death of burial, the resurrection of Christ, that again, the attitudes of those men, and I think it very much changed. Uh, the attitudes, uh, like we see Peter here, and in other, uh, the, the Gospels where you see John given some things to do, and Peter says, well, you know, or, or when Peter was told, he said, well, what about this one? And, and again, the Lord, uh, you know, told him to sort of focus on himself and to worry about that. I think Peter's heart would be changed. But notice what he says that Satan wanted to do, that Satan had a strategy against him. And this is much more different than a game. The games were sort of a, a lighthearted thing. Don't think we're uh, talking about games here. Satan had a desire that he wanted to sift Peter and he wanted to sift him as wheat. You know, that's an interesting picture that it pulls up in the Bible, an interesting word. You'll actually only find that word sift in this place in your New Testament. You won't find it anywhere else. You'll find it two places in your Old Testament that is translated the word sift. 
You'll find them in Isaiah and Amos. And they both have to do with judgment. They have to do with things that are coming and what, uh, what is going to happen. And we understand the process of uh, sifting something. Uh, maybe not necessarily wheat as they talked about, and I'll uh, get to that in a minute. I don't know if you've ever sifted for anything. Uh, I occasionally, when we uh, uh, go to the beach and stuff, and we look for things and uh, shark's teeth and other stuff, uh, it involves sifting. Uh, I haven't actually sifted for gold. It's on my bucket list. I hope to find a, uh, a bucket full, but uh, I've never done that. Some people go. They call it panning. But, but again, they, they take some of the rocks from the river. They uh, throw it around in a in a one of those dishes or maybe a sift something that's got it that but it sifts out other things and it leaves that in some cases uh, they might sift uh, uh, ladies putting on a cake they put their flour or their sugar in something and they they sift it out to take some of the lumps and to do that to spread it but it usually invite involves separating something in the process in the Bible of sifting wheat in the Old Testament and a few other places you may see where they talk about uh, threshing the wheat. And the sifting has the same connotation. It's the idea of separating the grain from the husk or the chaff. And they would bring it maybe and put it on a, a big table, but then they would actually uh, take something and flail on it or beat on it, as we might say, something to sort of separate that grain from the, uh, from the husk. And then a lot of times it was thrown up into the, into the wind or to the breeze, the light husk and all that, the chaff would blow away and the grain would fall back. And then they would have what was usable out of that. And so it gives a picture of something that's being uh, being taken and then again being uh, have some pain and some things uh, given to it. The, the idea that Satan desired to sift Peter as wheat. And I think that we get the picture there that he's wanting to take Peter and he's wanting to ruin his life. He wants to take him for the cause of Christ, take him from that, uh, absorb him with the things of self, absorb him with the things of uh, these worldly thoughts about who can be the greatest, lift him up with pride, lift him up with other things that, uh, again, will take him away from what the Lord wants to do with him. And uh, of course, the Lord said here, Jesus said that he had prayed for Peter. And he says, I pray that your faith would fail not. You know, what a prayer. You're standing there talking to, to Jesus. And Jesus says, I've prayed for you that your faith would fail not. Oh, that we might realize that I think he uh, has prayed for us as well. And that he takes into consideration that when we're tempted and tried, that our faith would fail not. And then he tells them that when you come through all this, that you would convert and strengthen the brethren. And uh, then Peter says, I'm ready. You know, Peter's very bold. Uh, again, we get a lot from Peter in the Word of God. But he says, I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready to go with you. I'm ready to go into prison with you. I'll go to the death with you. And so Peter speaks up. He says, Lord, he says, I'm right there with you. I'm going to go the whole way. And Jesus probably in a very calm voice, says that I tell thee, Peter. And he calls him by Peter this time. He called him by Simon a, a minute ago. And he says, The cock shall not crow this day before that thou thrice thou, that thou shalt deny, thrice deny that thou knowest me. Three times Peter will deny the Lord. And we know the accounts given in the Gospels. He'll warm his hands by the fire. And they'll ask him, it's like, oh, weren't you with that? man was Jesus is being questioned and he's being put through the trial. It's like, oh, you knew him. And Peter, oh, I didn't know him. And at first he denies him. And then he denies him with, with cursing. And he will hear the cock crow early in the morning. And it says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. And we know that what, a, what an amount uh, that would come to his heart. And again, the words of the Lord, as he probably remembered that, uh, would just penetrate his heart, knowing that he had failed his Lord, that his faith had failed, because three times he was questioned and he denied the Lord in that place. But the, Satan had desired to sift Peter. And in this case, his strategy would work somewhat against Peter. Now, the Lord, I think, got Peter's heart back in the end and all those things worked out. Peter goes on to, uh, to be a great, uh, uh, just to be a great beacon for the church and to do so much in the early church. And uh, given the place he is, I will uh, interject to you, uh, as some would say, they call him the first pope. He was not. Uh, he, uh, he went align with some of those things, uh, but he was a leader in the early church and he would go on to do, and of course, a couple of the books that he read, uh, wrote in the New Testament they're, uh, they're very encouraging, very pointed, again, about our Christian life. But let's think for a little bit. Let's think of Satan's strategy. How does he have a strategy against you as a believer, against me as a believer? What does he try to do? And again, it's more than 
playing a game. It's more than uh, just, uh, you know, this is a game of chance or something that I want to do. But it's a strategy against us, much like he had against Peter. You know, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 says that, again, we fight a fight that sometimes we don't even see. The Bible says, and again, this is in the passage where Paul speaks about the armor of Christ, the armor that we're supposed to put on and those things that we have. And again, the pictures of that of the Christian soldier. But it says in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, we fight a warfare and it's a warfare that really never quits. It's a warfare that fights for our faith. It fights for our mind. It's a battle that we have to engage every day. And if we don't have a strategy to overcome, if we don't have an idea of how we're going to win or how we're going to come out or that we're going to put our faith in the Lord and trust Him, we may not be able to see all that. But if we don't have that, then we're setting ourselves up to be sifted as wheat because that's Satan's desire. Think of his strategy. Satan is truly as uh, I sort of, again, trying to be lighthearted, mention those people that they played every game they played, they played for the win. Think what Satan is doing. He is playing for the win. It's not just for fun. He's taking your life because what, what does he want to do? What would he want more than anything else? He would want you to question the things of God. That's what his game has been, if we call it that, ever since the Garden of Eden. He came to, to Eve and he said, Yea, hath God said. And then he began to question those things that God done. And he desires to have you, as he said to Peter, he desires that again, that he can sift you, that he can again uh, trouble you, separate things in your life. Uh, Again, make your faith fail as Christ had prayed that Peter's would be strengthened. You know, uh, I think that it's Satan that makes doing the right things hard. Have you ever noticed how hard it seems like that uh, just to overcome, just to do the right things? You know, going to church sometimes can be a hard thing. All kinds of things step in our way. They step in our way and it's like, oh, this happened. Oh, that happened. Oh, I've got to take care of this. I've got to take care of that. And people, again, when you talk to them, until they make it a priority, until they set out and do that, Satan gets a lot of people just, it's not that maybe they're doing bad things, but he makes it a hard thing to do the right thing. You know, how many of us can probably say, well, it's a hard time to to find time to pray. I just didn't find enough time to pray last week. Have we ever said that to ourselves? Have we ever came to a place? Doing the right things becomes the hard thing. Our Bible reading, oh, the day is spent. And unless we've dedicated, unless we've made a time and we separated that in our lives, we've come to a place and said, I'm just going to take this moment. I'm going to read here. I'm going to read this much. Our Bible reading gets pushed off to the side. Why is that? Why does that become so hard? We can do other things, but we find that giving uh, becomes a real uh, wall for some people and it becomes hard to do because, again, uh, Satan puts that in our mind that we don't need that or he makes it uh, very hard. He, uh, he does things with that and it puts those ideas in our mind of what we're doing with it. Witnessing, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to disturb. I don't want to, you know, do this or that. He puts all kinds of ideas in our mind. He takes away those opportunities we have to step up and say, I'm going to do the right thing no matter what. We could probably fill that list and keep filling it. But Satan puts thoughts in our mind. He makes the right things to do hard between him and his adversaries and those that would work under him. And again, those principalities and powers, the things we can't even see, they make doing the right things hard. You know, what is his purpose? And this is where I wanted to give you something in this message that uh, I want you to realize what is his strategy. And as I spoke to you about the game of chess, uh, there's a part of that game they they would call the end game. And some of those who play, uh, they get into it and uh, they just define it once the game reaches a certain point. But it usually uh, comes down to that point where one's uh, going to win or there's maybe not as many pieces on the board. I don't know their technical definition of it. But we might say that that's what somebody desires to do to to win. Well, what does Satan desire in our life? What is his what is his end game? What is his goal uh, with mankind? And first and foremost, it would have to be damnation. It would have to be that the lost would die without Christ. If he could make that happen in a person's life just by uh, inserting things that, oh, you don't need church. Oh, you don't need to listen to that. Uh, oh, you're just as good as those other people that go there. 
Oh, you know, what a, what a crutch those people need of uh, going to church to make them feel a little better. Uh, you know, just think of the things that are said in this world about those who go to church and about those who entertain the gospel and know Christ. And uh, exactly what was said, I was reading a, a thread the other day. As a matter of fact, it was quite sad. Uh, it had popped up about some things and it was all who were talking about it. And some of it came back to some of the bad things they'd had in church. It came back with others who were very questionable of the things taught in church. And uh, you just seen and it's like, wow, the influence of Satan and again the influence of the things of this world that he's had control and how it's captured the mind of these folks and it made it very hard because they had questions that could be answered but unfortunately a lot of Christians were probably not equipped to answer them and not equipped with the Bible and some of those things had to be accepted truly by faith uh, our belief has to come down at one point there's no more science left there's no more things to say well what's the answer to this there's nothing else left to say, well, I can't find that. It does come down to say, I'm going to believe this based on what I see that God has done and what he's convicted me of. But if Satan can, he's going to take every soul he can with him. And he's going to take every soul to be to die in this world without Christ. And that means that they will die in eternity and they'll spend it without God in their lives and away from the presence of God. Satan has a desire to take all the souls that he can. That's his end game with mankind. But those of us who are saved, what does, he, what does he want to do in your life? What does he want to do in my life as a Christian and as a believer? And I thought about uh, some things that, uh, again, and we could probably make a lengthy list, but I just came up with about three more. And doubt was the first one. You know, what a powerful tool that doubt is. I don't know if you've ever battled with that. Uh, I battle with it uh, quite a bit on different things. And uh, it seems like it comes up. And matter of fact, it's like, why do I even think that? And then I, again, I think about, because I've got an adversary. I've got one who wants to make me doubt. He wants to make me doubt that God's word is that. He wants to make me doubt that those things had. Uh, over time in my life, I've doubted, uh, you know, my salvation in the past. And some of those things I had to make some of that sure. Uh, you know, and people, I uh, know several friends uh, who've went through that same thing, but it's because Satan comes in and he makes them doubt those things. He makes them doubt that they're saying, well, what's the best way to get you to not serve God? To doubt everything that God said, to put a place of doubt in your life that uh, you doubt. It's like, well, you know, I don't know if I should, you know, do this because again, I'm unsure. Uh, I have doubts about this. And if Satan gets you to think that, gets you to come to a place of not believing God and His Word and come to a place of just, uh, I, again, of sort of wandering to and fro, you won't serve the Lord. You won't be faithful to Him. And you'll come to a place where your service will be hindered by that. I thought of disobedience. If Satan can convince us that the wrong things are right, and matter of fact, some of that is done by our very fleshly uh, body and life that we live in. We're saved. Our soul is saved. We still have to crucify this flesh. We still have to make choices in this world. And we still have that fleshly influence that desires to do the wrong thing, say the wrong things, uh, believe the wrong things at times. And so disobedience falls into that. And Satan helps that, I believe. Because again, if he can get us to go down the wrong path and to go around the path of not serving the Lord and doing the wrong things, he again takes our life how many believers you know that will testify, oh, the years that they wasted of their Christian life because they started down a, a path of disobedience and they went out from the Lord and they got away from Him and then they might come back to Him somewhere, but they have a time span in their life that for years they came to a place that they just didn't serve the Lord. They didn't do anything fruitful for Him. And oh, what a place of disobedience. And Satan gets people there. You know, we can look at some of the Old Testament stories and some of the, again, the illustrations given of people in the Word of God of those who did just that. They disobeyed and God had to bring them back. He had to do something. Many times it sort of maybe ended their ministry because they came to a place of doubting. The prophet Elijah came to a place of doubting, a place of discouragement. Uh, you know, we look at Jonah sometimes when we think of disobedience and think of one who just didn't want to do what God told him to do. And he had to go through some of the things he did as God would draw him back and uh, give him that place. And still, even uh, we don't even get to finish uh, Jonah's story on a high note. And God gave him some great blessings, gave him some victories as far as spiritual things. Uh, most preachers would have been tickled to death to know that the town they just went through 
preaching to had a great revival. Jonah pouted a little bit over it. And the story ends there. And the account ends and we find but disobedience takes us to a place of not serving God. And discouragement. <coughs> you know, how many people come to a place that they're just discouraged about the things of God? They allow problems, and maybe problems within the church, problems among people, problems among other things. I mean, we can begin to probably, if we went around the room to start naming people we know that are like that today. They don't attend church. And why is it? Well, this happened. And therefore, I look at it and think, well, you know, that's just not right. And I mean, they start that kind of conversation. I don't know if you've ever had them. I, I find them a lot, but they start that. And then they start naming, well, you know, this person, uh, he lives like that. And I just don't think that's right. And it just puts me, you know, Satan begins to use that. And it has nothing to do. People around us, we have to realize they're going to fall to the wayside at times. There's going to be those who name the name of Christ. And, uh, some are going to, they're not going to finish well. And that's unfortunate, but the Bible tells us that. There's others. Again, we have to be in for what God moves in our heart and what He has us to do. And in some ways, we have to finish those things. Don't let discouragement take us out of the fight for the Lord. Take us out of walking for Him. So Satan has a plan. Damnation to the lost, but to the believer, doubt, disobedience, discouragement. Again, we could finish this list with a number of things. But what is it we can do? What can you do today to say, I don't want to be that one to be sifted? Peter didn't take what the Lord was telling him quite so well. Satan would sift him. He would fail the Lord. And then Peter, of course, returned unto the Lord. But what a time. And I guess, Peter, if we could probably talk to him today, those few moments, maybe those couple of days, and actually he wouldn't get to see the Lord again for a while. Oh, what agony and pain of heart he probably had for what he did. It's the Bible did tell us he went out and wept bitterly. But what can we do? What are our moves uh, to win? What is our strategy to overcome? First and foremost, believe the Lord. Believe Him for salvation. If you don't know Him, if you've never trusted in Christ, believe on what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. He died in your place, became your sacrifice, paid your sin debt that you might go to heaven if you would trust in Him, confess your sins and believe on the Lord and know Him as Savior. That's first and foremost. For us as believers, we've already trusted in Christ. We already know Him as our Savior. Let us just believe that God can. Let us just trust Him that He can do what He said He's going to do. That we can remain faithful. That we can have His help. And that matter of fact, we seek His help every day to realize we have an adversary. Matter of fact, if we don't realize that we have an enemy, uh, that's almost uh, the first part of the battle is you have to identify uh, that there's an enemy in this world. And sometimes enemy can be uh, self and flesh, but that's really aided and helped with the, the things because Satan would desire that no Christians serve the Lord faithfully. None of them uh, uh, become faithful in praying and reading their Bible and witnessing and just living for the Lord as God would have them to. Satan doesn't want any of that. We have to believe that God can. We have to put our trust in Him. And then it comes back because our strategy is pretty simple. Uh, but we, uh, we oftentimes, we fail it. We believe, but then we have to obey. You know, it comes back to God tells us what is expected or how we should live. We find that in the Word of God. Oh, that we might get into His Word. That we might put His Word into our hearts and then allow that to affect our lives. That we just might obey the Word of God, find His will through the Word, yield to the Spirit of God, that we just might serve Him in this world. Believe Him, obey Him, and then as I said, just go out and serve Him and be faithful to Him. You know, uh, that should be our strategy. That should be our plan. Is that I'm just going to do right. And uh, do right until until the stars fall, I think, as the old preacher Bob Jones one time said. And uh, we just have to do those things that God would have us to do. To believe, to obey, to serve. But you know, also, don't give up. You may find yourself today and you say, I'm like Peter. I may be that guy. I may be just like Peter. I think the Lord has sifted me. The Lord's put me out. I bathe in doubt. I'm discouraged today. You know, I've had times to where I've just disobeyed the Lord. I don't walk with Him as I should. And maybe one of those things, maybe it's something else. They've come into our life and maybe we can say, I'm just like Peter. Maybe we have a lot of days that uh, it's sort of up and down and we're like Peter. What I would encourage you is don't give up. 
You know, the one thing about Peter, when he realized, when the cock crew, when he realized that the message of the Lord was on point and that what Jesus said, that, that you'll deny me three times that night, and Peter had denied him again with, with cursing and just with strong words and voice and says, I don't know this man. And uh, as he sat there in the cock crew, and then again, when he realized the words of the Lord, how paralyzing that must have been to his heart. But you know, Peter didn't stay there. It says that he went out and he wept bitterly. He came back to a place of the Lord. He came back to serve Him. He repented. He got his heart right. And he began again. Oh, that we might take an account of Peter and realize that when Satan does win out in our lives, when he does get us in a place where we might say he sifted us or he's influenced us with something we shouldn't allow, may we not stay there. May we come back. May we repent. And may we begin again. The strategy of the adversary. You know, there's an adversary out for you today. He wants to cause you to, again, to not be saved if he can. He wants to cause you to not serve the Lord if he can. He'll do all he can to keep that from happening. Oh, that we may realize the strategy of the adversary. And may we do all we can to keep from being sifted much like Peter and uh, again, but once we find ourselves like Peter, don't stay there. There's a return to the Lord. Repent. You can't gain that time back. You can't undo what you did, but you can come back to a loving God who will allow you to begin again and to walk again to serve Him. Oh, that we might realize that we fight a war that sometimes can't be seen. And it's a spiritual war. And it's an everyday thing from the moment we get up till the moment we go to bed. And what we do in our life matters the things we influence our life with. That's why it's important to stay close to the Lord, read His Word, walk with Him. It'll help us. May we know the adversary and the strategy He has against us. And may we overcome it. Let us uh, stand with our heads bowed as we close our time today. And we have a time of invitation.